Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to this session. I think you'll find it um, very interesting. Uh, what I like to do for my panels is make them interesting and also introduce a little controversy because um, you want to be engaged, uh, also um, learn a lot, as well as I want you to contribute. So uh, what we'll do is the format is uh, I'll invite each of the speakers to provide a little bit of commentary. And what we try to do here for this panel is based on each of the speakers, they're each a subject matter expert in their own right, based on their background, skills, their observations. They'll talk about the impacts of the what we call the digital reality space, or as Ori said this morning in the introduction, XR. So everything related to AR, VR, MR, 360-degree media, and dot, dot, dot. And, and so the whole thing is wide open, ubiquitous, and immersing yourself in our talks. They will comment in terms of where they see things today and then where things might go. So essentially, how well can one predict the future? Can we know what might happen tomorrow, let alone 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and beyond? So, but that's part of the fun, right? There's no right, there's no wrong. It's all in the predictions. So please um, uh, sit back and form some questions, and we'll have some fun this afternoon. Also, I want to talk about IEEE really quickly. We are starting up a new initiative. Um, it's a continuation expansion of what was started as Digital Census by Yu Yuan, and we are calling it Digital Reality. You can check out the website, digitalreality.ieee.org, and um, you want to contribute to that uh, initiative uh, from the startup, uh, just go out and there's a form that you can uh, fill out and, and reach out to us. First, I'd like to invite our uh, speaker, uh, Connor. Uh, Connor Russomano is the Director of Advanced Interfaces at Meta, one of the pioneering companies in augmented reality. Connor is also the co-founder and CEO of OpenBCI, a company dedicated to open source innovation of brain-computer interface technologies. Thank you, Connor. Come on up. Thank you. It's great to be here, Kathy. Thank you very much. Um, all right. How's the audio? Is this good? Height? Cool. Um, okay. So uh, my, my presentation is titled Neuro Machina. Uh, the future of consciousness, not computers. Um, and full disclaimer, the views expressed here are my opinions. Uh, I work for two companies, but uh, you know, these are my opinions and things that I care about. I'm gonna be talking about ethics. I probably have too many slides here, so I'm gonna move quickly through some of them. Uh, some stuff about me. I currently work at Meta, which is an augmented reality company that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, I direct advanced interfaces, I do a little bit of R&D, some software stuff, some hardware stuff, um, but mainly looking at the broader landscape of industries beyond AR and seeing what's going to fit into the future of AR. Uh, in the past, I was a adjunct prof uh, professor at uh, NYU's uh, inter Interactive Telecommunications Program, as well as uh, the MFA Design and Technology Program at Parsons. Uh, and before that, I studied civil engineering uh, and computer graphics, as well as design and technology at Columbia and Parsons, respectively. Um, right now, I'm at Meta. This is our beautiful Meta 2 headset, which you can currently purchase, and uh, we will ship it to you. Um, but uh, I design head computers. So I have been designing head computers for quite some time now. Uh, this is the very first uh, head-worn uh, technology that I ever designed. It was a DIY project in grad school, uh, and it had a single EEG sensor on it that was able to measure brain waves in very low fidelity. Uh, and then put that on an Arduino so that you could then, you know, stream that wirelessly or do whatever you want with it. Um, so my early thesis concept was uh, effectively what became my company after my thesis. But uh, the, the working title was DIY BCI. BCI stands for Brain Computer Interface, and DIY is Do It Yourself. Um, my advisors uh, did not like my initial thesis concept because they believed it was too ambitious and they told me I was never going to pull it off uh, in less than a year. 
and they were right. Um, and so uh, in the process of changing my thesis direction, I established this lab called Brain Interface Lab, and it's also the origins of the OpenBCI logo, if you're familiar with it. Um, at which point uh, in my grad program, I, I kind of shifted gears and I tried to, to, uh, to think about how BCIs are gonna be applied at an application level uh, beyond just a platform tool level. Uh, and so I did, this ended up being my final project, which was a, a neuroimmersive graphic novel. Um, and what that means is, is that over the course of a, a short story, um, I was recording the reader's brain activity and having that subconsciously influence the plot. Um, so this here is a kind of a, an example of what's going on in the background. So the, if you're familiar with it, there's a NeuroSky device that can uh, classify brain activity and give you an attention metric that you can then use. So I just latched onto that very easy to access attention metric, but then had that drive different plot lines of a, of a short story. Um, and here you can actually see the chapter layout. Uh, so in chapter one, you always start in the same chapter. Depending on your attention over the course of the chapter, that's averaged and it's filtered you through, it's filtering you through different experiences based on how you react to the story. And this is all happening subconsciously. Um, so then grad school ended. I started OpenBCI with one of my, with one of my grad school uh, professors. Uh, we launched a Kickstarter campaign and then over the course of the next four years, uh, leading me to about a year ago, uh, we built uh, a suite of uh, biosensing tools that are open source, electrodes. Uh, this, if you're familiar, who here is familiar with Arduino? Cool, that's good. So uh, in many ways you can think of OpenBCI as the Arduino of, of biosensing. So you can measure elect, uh, electro, uh, EEG, EMG, ECG, brain activity, heart activity, muscle activity. Um, and then we sell those tools to researchers, uh, developers, uh, and scientists around the world. These are examples of some of the headsets that we designed throughout our prototyping process. And we even got one of them onto Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, that was a big moment. Um, at any rate, uh, we, we also designed software, open source software, for just latching onto the data and uh, essentially doing whatever you want with electrical data that's coming out of your body. Uh, all the licenses are MIT, so it's basically use at your own risk. Um, so moving on. Um, oh yeah, I mean, so our mission really is kind of democratizing brain-computer interfacing and biosensing tools so that more companies and students and people can begin to embed them into their own projects and applications. Uh, and now we're, uh, OpenBCI is being used in over 60 different countries around the world present, presently in just under four years. So the reason I talk about that though is because I, I do believe that um, you know, AR, uh, it goes way beyond optics. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna talk predominantly about augmented reality because I think that uh, it's kind of the umbrella that virtual reality is going to end up fitting inside of. Um, but I think that what's important to think about with augmented reality is that we're gonna have both, in the, and just the future of computing, uh, is that we're going to have both inputs and feedback from a system. And I want you to just kind of keep that in your mind. But then there will be these augmentation components of the fact that we are actually changing um, our fashion, what we're wearing, um, the fact that we may be able to replace limbs or add limbs, um, augment strength, things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, a topic I really want to touch on is privacy and security, and I think we're going to return to that during the panel. Um, I'm going to touch on a few really cool projects that have uh, been announced in the last year to two. So this is a project called Alter Ego, which was done uh, at Patty May's Fluid Interfaces Group. Um, this individual was able to classify larynx and muscle data from the throat to essentially speak inside of their own head to tell a computer to do basic arithmetic. Um, so uh, this individual, Arnob, was brought on to 60 Minutes and demonstrated in real time the ability to do complex math inside of his own head using uh, EMG and subvocal classification um, to essentially tell the computer what to do without anyone knowing. Um, that's wild. So here is a company called Leaf Therapeutics. This was a Kickstarter that was released uh, maybe two years ago, um, and they have this really awesome kind of uh, system on a, on, a, on a wearable board that you can stick to your chest, and it, and it collects and exposes this really interesting suite of uh, respiration, heart data, um, accelerometer data. I think that, you know, the trend here is that these computers, these really complex systems are starting to end up on the body, and I don't think that this trend is going to stop. Um, this is a really interesting company that, that launched in the last few years called Control Labs. Uh, I think that they are making unprecedented progress on the ability to interact with digital content seamlessly. 
Um, so I highly recommend you go to their website and check out this demo where they demonstrate the ability to uh, control a, a cursor in two-dimensional space and train a human to be able to do it using really, really micro EMG data from the arm where you don't even have to flex the fingers. You're just thinking about flexing your fingers and the fibers of your arm are being picked up even though the muscle's not being activated. So this is, a, this is really, really interesting developments uh, that are coming out now. Uh, here are some examples of uh, easy to access prosthetics. Um, this is a really cool company that spun out of MIT that's doing, uh, using GSR uh, for, for tracking seizures, but they're opening up their SDK so that people can use that data for other things beyond uh, clinical use. Uh, Neosensory is a haptics company. Uh, the point here, though, is that I I'm kind of trying to touch on these other industries and these other core technologies that I believe are going to be considered part of AR at some point in time, um, if they're not already in your mind. So what will, the what will the world look like when all of these tools become one tool? I think that's, that's a question that I'm really excited about and I'm trying really hard to find the answer to. Um, I believe that this leads us to a place of true human-machine symbiosis. Um, where you know, you're inside or it's inside of you. It's kind of confusing and hard to comprehend where it's gonna take us, but it is exciting. Um, but we also have a lot of responsibility to do it the right way. Um, so I believe we are now on the brink of highly efficient neuroadaptive systems, uh, similar to the thesis that I created five years ago, except as opposed to collecting data over an extended period of time and optimizing with really low latency, I think that time, that window of time is going to get smaller and smaller so that the neuroadaptive loop is going to essentially be happening in real time. Um, so I wanna bring this up. About a year ago, Facebook came out strong and they said, hey, we are now building brain-computer interfaces and that is a part of augmented reality. Um, that's really exciting for them to come out and say this publicly. Um, here, uh, Michael Abrash uh, was, is quoted saying, uh, I, I really like this term, full AR. Um, he says, think of full AR as having a tiny tireless assistant with a perfect memory and internet connection sitting on your shoulder, answering your questions and feeding you useful information by beaming, by beaming it directly into your eyes and ears. Super cool, right? Um, when I think about that, you know, when I, when I read this or when I heard him say this, I tried to map this as a model uh, into my own head. And, and this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, but this diagram, I think, is the simplest way to break down the, fu the future of computation. So, um, you know, I believe it's this two-part system, right, where we have uh, human and machine coming together as one, right? So now, with that in mind, come back to this diagram and think, okay, so as humans, right now, we have the ability to send commands and inputs to our computer to process information and maybe return some result from, a, from an application or the internet to... Uh, improve our knowledge and our intelligence. Um, right now, this is a pretty low latency interaction. You know, we type and we wait for it to process. We get some information back. Um, but I do believe that this, this relationship is going to move from the conscious mind um, and become more and more uh, part of the subconscious mind. And so I want you to think of the, the, the object on the right as your, that little friend that the guy from Facebook was talking about, your little assistant, right, that's just getting information about what you care about, what you know, how you react to different situations, and then it's feeding you both active feedback, but maybe also subconscious feedback that you're not even aware of. And it's trying to optimize you as a person or as a, as a system based on some high-level parameters. This is where I think we're going, and I think we're already there to a certain degree. Um, it's just abstracted by companies and corpor corp corporations and apps and tools and things that we use. Um, so what if you could type directly from your brain, says uh, the former VP of engineering of uh, Building 8 at Facebook. Um, and when I hear that, I think that's really cool, that's great and all, but I also think it's important to remember some things. So does anybody remember this? This happened in 2014. So. Facebook uh, was called out and admitted uh, that it was biasing um, newsfeed content to essentially emotionally test people at a large scale across populations. Of course, when the public found out about this, they were not very happy, and Facebook apologized. So, four years later, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica 
what you need to know about the fallout as it widens. I highlighted the important part here. Um, basically, Facebook as a company put themselves in a situation where this data was made available and could be used to actually manipulate the users of Facebook. So I think this is like, this is an important precedent for us to keep in mind as we start building these tools. And you know, the real question that I ask when, when I start thinking about this thing and as I'm building these tools for the future is why should we trust Facebook or any other purely profit-driven organization for that matter with the future of our consciousness? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. I just want to ask it so that we can hopefully discuss it during our panel. Um, you know, because when I look at that diagram, I don't see it as the future, the future of computers. I see it as the future of human consciousness. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really, really curious, but also concerned about what this interface, this operating system, this tool, product, company, whatever it ends up looking like, or whether it's a series of products, um, you know, what does this interface look like? What is the underlying architecture? Who owns the data that's being produced by your brain? Sure, so I gotta wrap it up. Um, so with that, I will end with three questions for the audience. What core technologies and tools need to com be combined in order for us to, s to honestly say we've achieved full AR? Uh, when these various core technologies required for full AR come together, what is that gonna look like? Uh, and the last question, which I think is the most important, is how do we prevent the Cambridge Analytica of biometric data as we build these tools and you know, can we make that a core design constraint? And with that, thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Connor. And um, I didn't pay him to do this, but great lead in to my next uh, speaker, uh, Brian Wassa. Uh, Brian is a partner at Warner Norcross and Judd. He litigates, so if you haven't figured it out, he's a lawyer. Disputes and counsels clients in a wide range of commercial and intellectual property matters. Um, so I'd like to invite Brian here and uh, share his uh, thoughts and uh, as he follows up Connor. So, so essentially, the piano is mixed of uh, technologists. Um, uh, we're going to talk about you know, ethics, social implications, and legal matters, too. So Brian, please come up. I'm not uh, trained in physical coordination, however. Um, so, um, I'm going to keep my remarks real brief for this moment in time because you don't want to hear me drone on. You'd rather hear a panel conversation, and that's why I don't have slides. Just a brief introduction to me and what I do. Um, like, um, like was said, I'm a commercial litigator. I represent uh, in innovators, startups, uh, large companies, uh, primarily in, in litigation, but also in pre-litigation counseling, working on avoiding um, uh, disputes in the first place. Um, and have, as a futurist myself, I've had, a, had an abiding interest in, in AR for a long time. This is my eighth AWE. Um, so I've, I've spoken here before, I know many of you already. Um, the, the, the intro, the, the nugget of wisdom, I guess, I would, I would give at this point from a, a legal perspective when we, talk about, um, when we talk about AR is something that I think um, was mentioned perhaps inadvertently this morning, but I think there, there, there's a lesson to be learned from it. How many caught the slide this morning uh, during Ori's speech that, that told us that the message is the massage? massage. Yeah. Yeah, the message is the massage. Um, wait, but I think there's something to be taken from that because um, AR is, in, in, itself, in, in its purest form, it is a platform. It is a, a media, a medium, just like newspaper or television or movies. Uh, it is, it is a, a platform on which we, put, we produce uh, creative content. So we ought to be thinking about it as a medium. And the law that applies to uh, augmented content is largely going to be that directed at media. So we're talking IP, we're talking uh, First Amendment defamation type stuff, and we can get into some specific examples. Um, but um, because each medium has its own unique characteristics, AR is the only one that, um, that actually intersects with the real world. That's the f defining characteristic of what augmented is. It takes the real world and it adds content to it. You don't have augmented reality without reality to augment. So there are the, the things, the considerations that are unique about AR are those that involve the interaction between uh, expression, 
and the physical, wor physical world. So uh, in my experience, for example, um, I, li I litigated a case, and we can talk more about it later if it comes up, but it, 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 inter it dealt with that inter interaction. How, how do we regulate speech? How do we, how do we think about augmented content that is meant to interact with physical sp spaces that's causing those physical spaces to be used in different ways than they uh, were intended to be, that um, they were uh, expected to be, but in ways that were previously legal until, until a, a certain rule came along. And then how, what, what are the boundaries for those rules? Do we regulate that as, it's, as if it's physical activity or do we regulate it as if it's speech? So these are the, the, the fun, unique questions that uh, we, get to, we get to noodle um, in, in my practice and in the, in the, with the group of lawyers that I work with. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. I know we've got plenty and I wanna leave time for a panel discussion too. Thank you very much, Brian. So a thought I had was, I guess, uh, with all this technology and, and growth that we will keep you in business for a long, long time. Okay, um, I'd like to invite uh, Jay. Uh, Jay Iorio is the Director of Innovation and Futurist for the IEEE Standards Association. He's focused primarily on mixed reality, virtual worlds, and their ultimate convergence with the Internet of Things, AI, wearables, and the built environment. Come on up, Jay. <clears throat> Thank you. I have two microphones, so I don't know if that translates to stereo, or I'll, I'll let you guys handle that. Um, I, um, I'm the director of innovation at the IEEE Standards Association, and my primary focus is, is XR, uh, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, and particularly how they're gonna come together over the next generation. Um, I mean, obviously we can't predict the specifics, but the general shapes are starting to emerge. Um, up until now, a lot of the AR talk has understandably been around vertical uh, applications, and it's, it's sort of obvious, it makes a lot of sense, uh, there are benefits to it and so forth, but those, those are very circumscribed applications. Uh, if you're working on an assembly line, if you're working in retail and so forth, um, there's no confusing that with reality. It's in a sense that it's an, it's an enhancement of reality and we, we know it just because of the framing of it. What I'm especially focused on is some of the things that Connor was implying. Um, when this comes together as a general purpose uh, full-time AR type application where it subsumes everything that we do with our smartphones, social media, uh, the laptop, and basically most of the applications that we run, um, that I'm imagining an AR scenario where you put your glasses on in the morning and you wear them all day and you have, uh, and this is of course in the context of an Internet of Things where you have sensors on your body, you have sensors in the environment. In a sense, the, the, um, the environment becomes, becomes sentient. It, it, it knows more and more about you. It's constantly refining its assumptions about you and what it is you want. And uh, it presents it to you and allows you to interact with it uh, in the form of what we currently call AR or XR. Um, in a sense, it becomes more like a VR application, a very hermetically sealed application, but with the real world sort of intruding. And I think that's where a lot of the thinking about XR has, has sort of come from, is the implicit acknowledgement that ultimately these things blend and there's a degree of what becomes reality, what becomes digital objects and so forth is, is, is going to vary probably by, by application and by situation and by what the AI backbone of this entire system is, is constantly learning and picking up about you. Um, it involves basically everything from healthcare. Um, uh, you, you could follow this down a, a path to, to some wild ideas of um, uh, constantly monitoring your, your biomedical issues, uh, health issues, fitness. I think a lot of those things become sort of uh, blended in this kind of environment. and. Uh, it, it, it's, it's suge street signage could dim and be illuminated, it could change. I mean, ultimately we're talking a generation down the road, but there's a real motivation for this where the city becomes, instead of an inert collection of buildings, it becomes really alive, it becomes a personal assistant, it becomes the one that, that Connor talked about sitting on your shoulder. Um, 
it's, it's a constant presence, an intelligent presence that, whose only goal is to learn more about you and present that content to you in a, a sentient space. Um, I'm working with the, um, and I'm gonna get the name wrong because it's so long, it's the IEEE Global Initiative on the Ethics of Intelligent and uh, basically AI, uh, Intelligent Machine Learning Systems. Um, and I'm the uh, co-chair of the Mixed Reality Group, and one of the issues that we're dealing with, well, a whole sort of uh, collection of issues we're dealing with, is what happens when this plays out gradually over the next 10, 20 years. And uh, this becomes uh, sort of equivalent to having prescription augmentation for glasses, when in fact, it, but it's, it's obviously much more profound than that. Um, what happens to the ethical issues when in effect an AI system is creating a reality for you that at this point would look like, okay, I've got some things hanging over space, but there, you know, there's, not, there's not an illusion. But when that becomes your day-to-day -day existence, what does that do to the basic issues that we're wrestling with today? And I could obviously go on and on about this. I know we're, we're limited in time. I would say that the Facebook and, and Cambridge Analytica um, uh, issues of the last year are in a sense a gift to us because they present a more straightforward and simple version of the kinds of problems that we would encounter, a uh, much more amplified version of the same problems of identity, privacy, um, especially identity, who you are uh, and how your identity sort of is a part of the environment is, is in a sense becomes part of your identity. So I don't have any answers to these questions, but I'd like to encourage any of you who are interested in, in talking about this or participating at some level to get in touch with me. And, and at the IEEE, we're working on everything from the basic nuts and bolts technical standards all the way up to these ethical discussions about the implications of the technology. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. We have B.C. Barriman. He's the creative director and founder of Heavy Projects, a senior civic media fellow at the USC Annenberg Innovation Lab and associate professor of emerging media at CAVAD. Please welcome BC. Uh, greetings, and I'm gonna keep this super short because really the meat of this is, is the panel discussion. Uh, but thank you to the IEEE, and, and this is like Brian, my, my eighth year here, and it's wonderful to see this to see this grow in the way that it has um, let me just suggest two things um, the first being with regard to augmented reality and, and as I've seen this this industry grow is this notion of presence um, we're here and, and VR was sort of added a little bit later into into uh, AWE uh, but let me focus this primarily on AR um, AR is really a, a, and this is, I think it had come up earlier, but it's really a physical tool. Uh, it, it's, it's something that should pull us into the present and help us better understand the present rather than constantly pulling us out of it. Uh, when we talk about sort of the telos, so the reason that why that we're interested in, in, in these things and in these technology stacks, I understand the, the monetization aspect of, of uh, AR and VR. And I think that's a big part of the other panel discussions that are going on today and tomorrow. What I want to talk about just briefly uh, is, is the ethics side of things. The IEEE is doing some great things uh, with ethically aligned design that Jay had just mentioned, uh, and I suggest you check that out. Uh, but that aside, if I think as developers, uh, as thinkers in this space, if we pay attention to the fact that AR is a physical tool, that it should help us understand contextually where we're at, why we're in this place, what we're doing in this place, uh, and help us appreciate in an experiential sense the people that we're with in those spaces, I think actually that's gonna help us create better experiences in the augmented environment. Uh, and then two, uh, the ethics side of things. I would encourage you as you go out and you meet people and you mingle uh, through the next couple of days, uh, is to have discussions, because this is really the places that these types of discussions needs, needs to happen uh, on the ethics side of things. Uh, we're sort of all flying blind a little bit in terms of how these things are gonna impact society. Uh, when I first started coming to AWA, I had no kids, now I have two. Uh, so I think a little bit more intentionally about these things. 
I got into this really to, as a more of a provocateur, and maybe to keep people like Brian in business, uh, and augmenting ads in public spaces and using street art uh, to do it, to sort of use the existing ad framework to put digital art in augmented reality out in public spaces. Now I give talks a lot, and a lot of it's on the ethics side of things, um, and it's something I care deeply about. So let me just sort of encourage you on that front to, to as you go out, to have those types of conversations with one another on the, on the certainly on the, on the verticals that we all talk about, but on the, on the ethics side as well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Daniel Kenyon, I'm with Furious M. Um, this is a question for the panelists. You all brought up Cambridge Analytica. Um, I happen to be working for a client who's focused on under 12 year olds um, with social media, but soon to go into immersive experiences. Can you talk a little bit about what you think some of those boundaries that need to be in place for under 12 might be? Thanks. Do you have the mic? Use that mic. Yeah. Um, can we use that mic? There we go. Uh, just uh, let me throw something at you, and let me take you way back, and just go go Aristotelian on you. Is is moderation? So, something that that I think is in is a little bit on the softer side of the sciences. Uh, but I, I, I think is effective is this notion of, of how do we moderate behaviors. Um, I've been on plenty of, of, of discussions on the other side of things, on the development side, about addictive hooks. Um, those di addictive hooks are built into most of these systems. Um, I would say that, for better or for worse, uh, understanding how to moderate these technologies, especially when they become much more immersive and there's more of this sort of pull, this uh, I'm going to use a, a newer term, this FOMO poll, right? This fear of missing out. That if you can moderate behaviors and understand that, okay, look, there's a reason that why we're, we value the present in, way, in ways that we, we shouldn't allow these technologies to we can always incur or, or make incursions into our present by pulling us out into what's absent. Um, and I think how we moderate those behaviors, we're still trying to understand that. I think Jay actually has <laughs> some pretty good sal salient thoughts on that. Actually, yeah, well, actually, I really like the, the point that you brought up of like the, the addiction hooks, right? I think that presently a lot of applications and tools are designed specifically for that because we, we get the dopamine push button. You know, even the squares that are designed on your iPhone and your, and your, and your Android devices, your mobile devices, you know, Instagram, whatever. How, how often do you find yourself just clicking buttons on your phone without actually thinking about it? Show of hands, anyone? A lot, right? So I don't think that's by accident. And so, and, and this actually comes back to the point where I brought up is that like, when we have these applications that are being designed into this closed loop where we have much richer information about the human's reaction, the mind's reaction to content, the ability for, for companies and application designers to optimize that comp content for the dopamine hook is gonna be that much greater. And that's why I think it's, it's, like, it's very, very careful. We have to be very careful now to start, especially for people below the age of 12, you know, preventing them from being in an environment where all they're doing is clicking push buttons and getting immediate rewards for what they're doing. Um, that's just my two cents. So. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, from a legal perspective, I mean, we, we work by analogy to what we've already done. So we already have in place, you know, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. That's some, that's, those are some, there are some norms behind that law and, and others like it that ought to be extended to the augmented medium as much as any other digital medium. Um, but especially in the under 12, I like BC, I have a couple under, under 12 too, so I think about this quite a bit. And you know, I, I limit their, their use of their Nintendo DS, I limit their use of my phone. Um, you know, I let them play with my Google Glass, but not too much because I don't want their eyes to go cross-eyed. Um, so um, I, I limit their use, use of VR. I, wanted, I wanted, want them to try it out, be, be 
be fluent in these technologies, but uh, that's, I mean, we, that's where parenting comes in, and I think as parents, we need guidelines like that too. So at the same time that we're developing the technology, I think from the softer side, from the social side, um, you know, we, we should contribute to the conversation about what the, what the lines ought to be uh, for kids. Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm concerned with the effect that it could have on children. One of the advantages I have, for example, is that I grew up with typewriters, and all of these things came afterwards, so I was able to integrate them in an adult way. Um, so I'm totally tapped into them, but there's still a memory of a previous, you know, they're, they're, this is an imposition on reality. Whereas with children, they're going to see this is, this is their reality, and it's so seductive, and so many of these apps are absolutely addictive that I would like to see some studies, uh, they may exist, I'm just not familiar with them, of the effect that, that uh, this kind of digital interaction can have with, with children under 12. Uh, just real quickly, UCLA did a study, oh, I think it was about four years ago now, that, uh, and granted this is rats, uh, but about 60% of the, of the higher functioning, of brain functioning shut down in rats in VR. So, so this illusion of, uh, you know, the, the higher level of, of input creates higher level of brain functioning. Maybe Connor can speak to this. Uh, but that's not always the case. VR headset look like for a mouse? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm a visual person. So when you said that, I was like, you have a bunch of little mice running Lost around? Your <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go on. Uh, so uh, I would say that, we, it, that we're still sort of vetting these technologies. And... Uh, you know, we don't want to. We don't want to sort of collectively work on the next uh, Manhattan Project. It's better to have these discussions ahead of time rather than sort of looking retroactively like a like a nicotine company. <laughs> well said. Okay, um, I want to extend a, a thank you to all the panels. A great conversation here, and a lot to offer and for people to really think about. So, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>